What's up, guys? Welcome to The Quest. I am your host, Justin Kahn, and today my guest is Matt Gamash Asselin, founder and CEO of Alto. Alto is a digital pharmacy startup that today serves tens of thousands of patients, has over 700 employees, and has raised over $350 million in funding. But just five years ago, Matt was an engineer at Facebook dreaming about startup ideas, and that's when I met him. Matt and I met through a friend as he began his startup journey, and over the years, I've watched Matt struggle and fight to build Alto, facing down disaster many, 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 many times. In my mind, he's the ultimate entrepreneur survivor, and that's why I wanted to tell a story, and I'm really excited to get him on the podcast. And one of the things I love about Matt is his relentless energy to learn and improve. Both of us have been on the meditation journey over the last couple of years, and the results of that personal growth journey have really shown up in how he operates as a founder and a leader today. In our conversation, we talk about coming to Silicon Valley, founding the company, the grind of the early days, the early office and how grimy it was, learning from mentors, being conflict averse, the confusion between self-awareness and self-criticism, meditation, and much more. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with my friend, Matt Gamash Aslan, founder and CEO of Alto. Welcome, Matt. Thanks for joining me. Thank you. Uh, we have a long history together, so I'm excited to dive in this conversation. It's always fun to talk to people. There's a lot of stories and uh, shared history. So you are the founder of Alto. I like to say that Alto started out of my living room five years ago. It but really did. <laughs> Maybe you can tell me the the story of how we met and how you got started being a founder of a tech company. Yeah, for sure. I actually don't know if you remember this, but I actually met you at the Fly, the bar in uh, in SF. Fly bar. Fly bar. That's right. <laughs> and I remember when I met you, it was just me, you, and Tcon. And I, I thought you were like the scariest, most intimidating person in the world. But I think you had just finished like reviewing a bunch of YC applications and you were super tired and you're just like, oh, yeah, who's this guy? Whatever. Um, and I'm like, oh, my God, Justin Khan doesn't like me. Oh, that was so the, sp- the pre-spiritual Justin. That was, the sp- <laughs> <laughs> that was the pre-spiritual Justin indeed. And I think after that, I at some point came to your house and I'm still actually confused. Maybe you can tell me why, but. You, you, I got the code for your door. You gave me the code to your door and just started showing up to your house after I left Facebook because I wanted to start a company. I think you were still at Facebook. I think you were still at Facebook when you started coming. I remember. I think you're right. Our mutual friend Tikon introduced us. And for the listeners who don't know Tikon, Tikon is a, a friend of mine who had started a company very early in YC history called Scribd the reading company. And then eventually he went on to start a new company called Parse, which was Heroku, or like AWS for mobile apps, like a backend for mobile apps. And that's how you guys met, right? You were you joined him at Parse as one of the early engineers. Is that right? That's right. That's right. I think it was a four or fifth employee or something at Parse. And you had to beg him for a job, right? He didn't want to hire you. Oh man, I forgot about that. Yeah. So I I was actually still in school at the time in Canada, and I applied to Parse because I'd used it in school, and I thought it was a really cool product. And I, I, they flew me out for an interview. It's like one of those typical coding tech interviews, right, which I totally bombed. And I waited like two weeks. They finally gave me an answer. This was around Christmas time. And he was like, yeah, sorry, like we're, we're passing. And I was just so devastated because I really wanted to work there. And so I ended up building this app on Parse and then sending it to one of the founders. And I was like, hey, I don't really care what job you give me. I just really want to work for Parse. Here's a cool app I made using Parse. I think it's amazing. And uh, that that founder was James Yu, one of the other founders said, okay, cool. Why don't you contract with us while you finish school? And you know, we'll see how where this goes. So I was like, yeah, sure. That sounds amazing. And so I, I contracted with, with them for like, two, three months. And uh, they ended up giving me an offer for a full-time job as soon as I graduated, which I'm super grateful for. I, I, I had bombed every other coding interview too that I had with Google and Square at the time and a bunch of tech companies. And this was kind of really my, my only job offer. That was your one shot. 
It was my and one so, shot at getting out of Canada. So you got in the door. <laughs> you got in the door. You got out of Canada. You got to Silicon Valley. You worked for Pars for two years. Was that right? And then they got sold. It was a bit over a year before we got acquired by Facebook. And then I was there for, for two years after the acquisition. Got acquired by Facebook two years after the acquisition. And I remember TCon coming to me and telling me, well, you got to meet this kid, Matt. He worked for me. He's super excited to start a startup and you should help him. That's kind of what he said. And so that's when we met. And I remember that night, actually, we met at the bar. I was pretty tired. You know, you were interested in startups. We were talking about startups. And then I had this home office. I guess you could call it that. It was basically an apartment <laughs> under my the apartment I lived in. My friends who wanted to start startups, they would just come over and like hack on projects at my home office. It's kind of like Ehrlich Bachman's house in Silicon Valley. <laughs> and you just started coming over with uh, your friend, Jamie, who's also at Paris that you guys work together. We used to just start riffing on ideas, right? Is that how that's it happened? Right. That, that's right. That, that, that's vaguely right. And we, we, we would come on like our work from home days or we'd come in the evening and we would work or on weekends and we would work a little bit and we would chat with you a lot. And you, you really pushed us. I remember at some point you said, you know, I, I think my Jamie, my co-founder, you know, said something like, you know, well, I want us to raise money before I leave my job. I want some certainty. And you said to him, you're like, Matt, Jamie, if you aren't willing to bet on yourselves, why would somebody else bet on you? And I remember, you don't remember that? Yeah. That's and I, wise I remember thoughts. That, very wise. <laughs> I remember that day I quit my job or that week I quit my job and Jamie did it you know, around the same time. And then we started working out of that house every day for, for a few months. And we had kind of our personal YC because every night you would just kind of beat up on us a little bit and give us some, some wise words. And so what were those early days like? Who thought of the idea of Script Ash was what it was called at the time? Not Alto, like where would that idea come from and how did you guys settle on it? And then what were those early days like? Yeah, you know, I think Jamie and I both were a bit disillusioned with Silicon Valley at the time. We both had moved here, Jamie from Boston and, and me from Ottawa, Canada, thinking like, oh my gosh, Silicon Valley is where the world changes, right? Like people are working on amazing new things. And we get here and it's it wasn't quite that revolutionary. There's a lot of ad tech companies, a lot of social media companies, a lot of not really life altering things. And I was like, well, why can't we do that? I had actually um, been on a path to medical school when I was in college and somewhat last minute decided not to go and move here instead. And so I had this tie to healthcare and wanting to do something somewhat maybe socially impactful is a way to say it. And, and Jamie had the same desire. And so we had looked at healthcare as like, well, maybe there's something interesting we can do here. I think also Jamie and I both had a bit of this contrarian bend where we're like, well, but let's do something that everyone else thinks is lame. No one else is really interested in. And pharmacy is kind of this dark corner of healthcare that has been largely ignored. And we both just became fascinated with the industry and started digging in. We did a lot of research. We would just go around and just say, hey, we're business school students. Can we ask you questions, Mr. Pharmacist? And we would just talk to pharmacists and understand how it worked. And we kind of slowly understood enough to see this opportunity of, man, it's this absolutely massive industry. It seems really obvious from the outside, like how to fix it, right? You just you go to a pharmacy, you're like, just don't do this. Do e-commerce instead and you'll be way better off. And there was this fascinating adherence problem, right? About half of medications in the U.S. aren't taken by patients properly and that leads to over 100,000 deaths and hundreds of billions of dollars in wasted spend. And we looked at this, we're like, this doesn't seem to make rational sense in a capitalistic market, right? Like this would have been solved because you can make something better for people. You will make a lot of money in a big market. And it seems obvious how. So, so we're probably missing something, right? Otherwise, this would be solved. And so we, we, we kind of just kept digging at it. In these early days, we put up a website. We're like, I don't know, we'll probably figure out what to do if we get an order. And then we got somebody's like, oh, I have birth control. Can you deliver this? And we're like, uh-oh, I guess we can show up to the pharmacy and pick it up for them. And so we did that. And then we, we started partnering with the pharmacy. It was like, well, if we transfer all the prescription to one pharmacy, it'll be like easier for us to pick it up and send it to the patients. And so we did that for maybe two, three weeks. 
And then we realize, you know, really the only way to make the economics in this business work, given the margin profile and the complexity, is if we are the pharmacy. Like we need to actually have a pharmacy. And so I started driving around the Bay Area, knocking on doors. And this is like not how you go about buying a pharmacy. But I, you know, didn't understand how bankers work. So I, I literally just went to pharmacies and I would be like, hey, can, can I buy this establishment? <laughs> can I buy this fine pharmacy establishment? Exactly. <laughs> Are you for sale? And they would mostly be super weirded out and be like, why is there a 14-year-old in my pharmacy saying they want to buy this place? <laughs> and eventually, we actually found Vivian, this woman who had started this, this pharmacy called AG Pharmacy. AG was for Army and Guerrero. Army is the old name of Cesar Chavez here in the mission in San Francisco. And she was like, no. And are like, but maybe yes. She's like, no, I'm, I don't want to sell. I'm like, but, but maybe yes. And she's like, well, I'll consider it. And we had that little crack in the door. And we, we talked to her for a week or two. And she agreed like, yeah, actually, you guys seem like interesting people that want to do the right thing. I'm like, yeah, well, I'll, I'll sell this to you. I'd like to retire anyway. And it, it you know, took us three or four weeks to start negotiating with her on the price. And of course, we had this really scientific method of pricing a pharmacy, which was how much money can we raise and why don't we give away half? <laughs> yeah, and then you know, we got to, all right, like, how do we get money now to buy this thing? And, and we, we right. had this helpful benefactor in, in justice. <laughs> so you were, I remember at the time I was thinking, I didn't know anything about the pharmacy space and very little about healthcare at the time. And I remember thinking this was an interesting problem to solve just because it was so annoying for so many people. Right, like going to Walgreens, picking up your prescription, it was just such a low NPS experience, such a negative experience. There had to be something different. And right. Instacart had already been around and other delivery services. So it just kind of made sense. A big market delivery, something delivery should work here. But we didn't really know it. We were all very naive, I guess, about it. And so you guys started delivering prescriptions from another pharmacy. And then you'd go pick them up and then you'd bring them to my living room and then repackage them in like script dash packaging and then deliver them then found the vivian and ag pharmacy and bought and we're like hey justin we need okay now we need to raise some money because it was just you and jamie at the time right jamie had made this That's mobile right. app that anyone could kind of log into and say hey i have this prescription and then you were like doing the deliveries like literally on the motorcycle that's right. <laughs> and so we raised that angel round, right? We raised like an angel round. I put in some money. Some friends of mine put in some money. And then you bought this pharmacy. And tell everybody what the pharmacy was like, and what moving in there was like. Oh, my God. Oh, man, talk about Scrappy. This was a pharmacy that had started, I think, probably mid-60s and hadn't really been renovated or changed much since. Right? And here we were in 2015. Right? So, you know, so it's 55 years later, and we set up our little camp here with me and Jamie, and uh, we had one employee um, as well at the time, Jessica, in the back in this little closet, and it was where they stored all the adult diapers and all the, the paper towel. And we had two chairs, and we were just sitting there on these wooden shelves around us. It, it was, <laughs> there's a lot of things that had been accumulated over 50 years in that little shop. It was quite, quite rough. And over the course of about a year that we were in this, literally in this retail store, this is where our office was. I mean, we kind of slowly moved things around to make room for more and more employees. But, you know, this is 1,500 square feet. We were on top of each other, basically. And I think maybe two months since, all right, we need to start throwing some of the stuff in this pharmacy that isn't really needed. I think we found this like, because these condoms that had expired in 1970, these sheepskin condoms. <laughs> and we rented a U-Haul because like 1-800 junk is actually very expensive. And, and so we rented this U-Haul and we said, well, if we fill it with stuff, we can just drive over to Ecology and just throw it out ourselves. And they like weigh you in and out, right? And that's how they charge you. And so we filled this U-Haul twice with a bunch of stuff from the pharmacy and we just drove to Recology. And I think we threw away two tons of stuff at Recology over a couple weekends. And, you know, we, we put up this wall, actually, sorry, it was Christine, your, your wife had a contractor that she knew well, and he built us a little wall so we could have a little bit of an office space. At some point, we wanted to take the wall down. So Lily, Jamie and I sledgehammered the wall down. <laughs> we, we just 
our position in those days, and we weren't paying ourselves yet, was like, look, we should spend as little money as possible because raising money is hard and we're only going to be successful if we are the most efficient company at making progress, right? And, and money is really time, which is progress. And so we, we try not to pay anyone. Most of our employees we had said, we'll delay your, your, your salary for a year. We'll pay you after we raise money. We, we didn't want office space because we, we didn't want to have to, to spend more money. And we just kind of every day would sat in this grindy pharmacy seven days a week from you know, 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. And I, I think back in those days now, and like, I don't actually know if I'd be able to do it again. It was really, really rough. But at the time, it was just so exciting. Right? Like, oh, my God, we're like growing. We're doing things. We're working on something fun. And this is ours. Right? This little retail shop is ours. You're, you're 25 years old at the time, right? Or 26? 25. 25. Came off of making a pretty good salary at, at Facebook and going through that parse acquisition. And then now you're sitting in this grimy pharmacy with silverfish that would fall off the ceiling. Remember? <laughs> I forgot about that. You're right. And eventually the team got big enough that you had to expand into a real office, right? So tell us about finding that office next door. I mean, I always get a kick out of that. Oh, That's man. I use that as an example of how scrappy founders should be. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, so, we, so we got to maybe four employees and maybe five. And so we were in this little store still and we didn't have any room. But right next to the pharmacy was this abandoned doctor's office that hadn't been in use for a few years. And there was a big for sale sign on it with a name. And so we called the realtor and we're like, hey, I know you guys are selling this. We'd love to rent it while you sell it, at least for a few months. And the, the, the realtor was like, well, I, I don't think you want to. It's really not in a usable state. We're like, I, I mean, it's like walls in the ceiling. We're fine. And so we got in touch with the owner. The owner was like, well, actually, um, we're selling the land and it's getting demoed in two years to build apartment buildings. And actually, now it's apartment buildings if you go to that corner. But she said, well, if you want to pay us money and we'll give you the keys, I mean, we don't care. Sure. And so we visited it and we walked in and it was literally like, you know, old school wood paneled walls, doctor's offices. And there was probably 12 doctor rooms in this little lobby area. And it was really terrifying. It was probably one of the scariest places I've ever had to walk into. It was literally like a haunted house, boarded up windows and broken glass. And these old x-ray machines are just busted on the ground. Walls were ripped out with the, the insulation all, all over the floor. Really, really quite scary. There was no carpet. So it was all just like press board. We ended up saying, you know, great, we'll take it. And we'll just work out of this little lobby area, which was maybe a thousand square feet. We can put some desks here and a couch. It'll be great. And we, we said, well, how, how much do you want? Just like, I don't know, 2,000 bucks a month. It was like probably 13,000 square feet. It was a big, big office building. We were like, yeah, great. Sounds good. We'll give you two grand a month. And we just rented that month to month for really probably nine months of that first year. And we would just walk between the pharmacy and this old building. And the heat was broken. The heater was broken. So it'd get super cold. So we, we ended up naming this building Canada. Um, so <laughs> myself and, uh, and our order employees, Jessica, were both Canadian. So that, that became Canada building in our, in our campus. I remember walking in there and it would be freezing. And everybody would just be wearing a winter jacket <laughs> while they're programming or filling orders or whatever it was. And then, you know, you guys had so much space. There were all these different rooms. Jamie had set up like a bench press in one of the rooms, I remember. <laughs> and it was it was a crazy, crazy office. It was a terrible right. office. It was a terrible office. And we actually, when we moved out of that office into our kind of first real warehouse slash office space that we still have today, we named all the conference rooms after that building. So, you know, we had in that office, we have a room called conference room gym because of that room where we put in a bench press. <laughs> um, we have zombie room, which was this boarded up wood, like boards over the windows and the door. And there was like no light in that room. So it was really scary. So we called it the zombie room. So we made that one of the conference room names. We had our typewriter. So this pharmacy was still using a typewriter for creating patient charts. And so we put the typewriter in a room as a fun prop. So that room is the typewriter room. So we ended up like keeping that part of our culture when we, when we grew and scaled out of that. But mostly like I actually loved it. I, I thought it was, it just made me feel 
efficient and productive, thinking about, look how much we're making do with just the basics, right? Like we don't need Herman Miller furniture to make this company work. All we need is like grit. That's one thing I've always admired is your grit. So I think this company has taken a tremendous amount of it, you know, watching from the outside and as a board member and advisor, I've seen you deploy tremendous amounts of grit and resilience. So like, tell us about some of the stories of when you hit walls. You know, it wasn't a straight shot, right? Today, the company's like 700 something people, $350 million in capital raised, tens of thousands of patients, multiple states. It's a real operation. But how did you get from being in the zombie warehouse, Canada, to where it's at today? And what are some of the barriers that you had to run through? You know, I think even today, it's hard for me to feel successful. I feel like I've always had this feeling of we need to do more, we need to do better. I think what I thought startups were was like, you know, you start low and you just learn, you grow and you get more and more confident as the company grows. And everyone had told me, well, you know, psychologically difficult, ups and downs, it's a roller coaster ride. You know, I'm sure everyone's experience varies. For me, roller coaster was always at the bottom just consistently. And like somehow things kind of worked and got better, but the sheer amount of problems that are always ahead to deal with just always made me feel at an extreme low at almost all times. It was always like we're about to fail and it was life or death. And th that takes this immense mental toll on you. I don't think it's something that somebody could have articulated to me in a way that I would have understood before we started. I think that that is both what has been most difficult and most rewarding in a way because learning how to cope with it, assuming you can learn how to cope with it, just makes you grow so much personally that in retrospect, it definitely has been hell at times. I, I, I wouldn't trade it for the world because I, I, I changed as a person. I mean, you know, th through those five years to where we are today, and there's a limited amount of work left to do even today. I mean, we almost ran out of money probably four times. If I can count them. We were, call it, less than a week away from cash out. One of the first times this happened, you actually gave us a half a million dollar loan for no interest that it took us probably a good year to pay you back. I <laughs> and, forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> We would have run out of money without that money, Justin. Thank you. And, you know, at times it was like, you know, term sheets pulled and a few weeks of cash left. Like, how can we possibly raise money in a few weeks? And every time we would be sad, we would feel this, how depressed and difficult it was. And I cried many times over those years in just like sheer desperation. And we would say, okay, great. We might as well just try. Right? We might as well do something and just see what happens. And I think it's every time we would accept the fact that we had failed and we would say, just like, whatever, well, let's do the next thing because we might as well. And we would find a way out. But I, I kind of came to appreciate how the, the attachment to success and this need to say, like, no, we, we have to succeed is what drives almost all of the pain. And if you just say, I, we might fail, we might not, I, I don't really know, I can't know, let me just do the next thing. Let me take the next step. It, it tends to be less, I think, fatalistic than, than your mind will make it to be. That's such a powerful realization. When did you make that realization in this five-year journey? I think probably about maybe 18 months ago, I think is where is when I it's like right after series C, so maybe maybe two years ago now. Yeah, two years ago. I hit a wall of I can't actually do this. I am not humanly capable of making this company successful. And I wanted to give up. And it was like very difficult few months for me. And this is when I started getting more and more into meditation, thinking, well, maybe this will like give me a release of stress. People say this helps with stress. I was confused as to like, how do I build a culture? There's things wrong with our culture. There's things wrong with business. I don't know what to do. And you introduced me at some point to conscious leadership and a coach, Matt Mashari, who I, I owe a lot to. 
And it was over the course of probably seven, eight months that I started just shifting my perspective of the world, which along with that came this realization of, oh, I, it doesn't matter if we succeed or die. All that matters is, can we just do our best? Because that, that's all you'll ever be able to do anyway. So just go do that. I, honestly, I don't think I, I would have been able to keep going had it not been for conscious leadership, meditation, a lot of kind of the, the work surrounding that as well. So I remember one story we talked about a couple of days ago, actually, that I want to bring up was meditation and specifically going through this Vipassana retreat. I remember seeing you right after, maybe that was a year ago or a year and a half ago, you did a Vipassana silent meditation retreat. And we met up right after you came back and you were completely transformed. The amount of peace that you had was very palpable, right? You were like, I'm okay with whatever happens. I accept it. The equanimity was at an all time high. And it was funny because I think in contrast, I was at a period of time when I was not very equanimous, maybe a year and a half ago, I was very stressed out about my company at the time. That really served you because you went on to close a monster round from SoftBank of $250 million really quickly thereafter. So can you tell us about that and how that played out? Oh, <laughs> I actually don't think um, the SoftBank team knows this. Well, they will now. <laughs> they will now. <laughs> We had been talking to them for maybe about a month. We had done kind of one initial pitch and maybe one small follow-up meeting. And then I had this 10-day meditation retreat at Spirit Rock scheduled. And, you know, you have to do this like months in advance. And so I had this schedule. I really wanted to do it. And so I asked the team like, hey, okay, I don't want to like seem to solve bank. You know, I chill out and I don't work hard. So don't tell them I'm out. I'll give you access to my email, my phone number, everything. So you can communicate as me. Just schedule the next meeting with them, not in that week, and you know, make up some excuse. And so that follow-up meeting, and they wanted to do like a four or five hour deep dive in everything with six of the, the, the SoftBank team with, with me and, and my team. And they wanted to do this as a final diligence thing. And so that got scheduled two, three days after I was supposed to come back from this meditation retreat, which I actually didn't know was scheduled until I came back from the meditation retreat. So I, I was on this retreat. If you've been on one, you'll know like you do get to an extreme state of, of calmness to the point where when I came back, I had a hard time speaking loudly. I really wanted to whisper because it, it, was, <laughs> it was almost, it was like distraughting myself when I would speak loudly and um, it was too much. And so I was like, oh my God, how am I going to do this four or five hour deep dive on the business when I'm like super calm and at peace? I said, you know, whatever, I'll, I'm sure I'll figure it out. I, the night before, I ended up just like yelling a lot to just trying to juice myself back up. It didn't really work. But I got to this meeting and unlike almost every meeting I've had with any VC prior, I wasn't nervous at all. My hands were shaking. My heart wasn't beating quickly. I was just, you know, here's some people. Great. And that, that really surprised me. I was like, man, I, I, I didn't do anything. I just am not nervous. And then they started asking questions. And instead of trying to figure out what the right answer was, I just like answered their question. I just saw exactly what was true. And they just kept asking questions and I had my whole team there and they ended up saying almost nothing the whole meeting. I just kept answering. No slides. And I just kept driving. And after like four hours, they were like, cool. And, you know, a week or two later, they did a couple like financial follow-ups. They give us a term sheet. I really think that meditation retreat is what allowed me to close that round. Otherwise, I'm not sure I would have been able to be as present and confident in that meeting with them. That reminds me of my own experience with Atrium. You know, my last company, I closed this $65 million round led by Andreessen. And I remember being in the room to do the partner meeting and then sitting down. And in my gratitude journal that morning, I had written well, I'm just happy to be in the room. It's amazing to just be in the room and to have this opportunity, whatever happens. And I had this sense of calm and whatever happens, I accept. And then I was just, as questions came out, I was cool as a cucumber and was able to just give a powerful, honest, confident answer that didn't need the world to be any way or didn't need a certain response. You know, it was just, here's what is true. 
I remember walking out of it. One of my chief of staff, who was in the room at the time, because he'd prepared most of the material, he was like, that was like a meditation. <laughs> like your answers were like a meditation. And, you know, we closed the round after that. Fascinating. The other thing that came up for me when you were talking was you have been, in some ways, the world's worst fundraiser and also the world's <laughs> best fundraiser, right? I've, worst fundraiser, I mean, in, in a way, I think you have been historically very nervous and caught up about it and it shows through. And so VCs have been turned off by it. But at the same time, you've been the best fundraiser because you've probably raised money from or talked to hundreds of investors on your path to raise this money. And it wasn't all as easy as the soft bank route, right? Most of it was incredibly difficult. And we almost ran out of funding multiple times. You've had term sheets pulled, et cetera. So how do you have that resilience to keep going on something that was one, not natural for you, but also, you know, you weren't being super successful at in the beginning? Oh, man. I think when I think back, right, of, of the four big rounds we did, or the four institutional rounds we did, A to D, A and C were were very difficult. C was probably the hardest. And B and D were extreme or easy. B and D didn't require a huge funnel because they got both got preempted. And, you know, I, I guess I was just in the zone between those two. And, I mean, you know, Justin, you've been a, a, a huge mentor for me in, in this given you have this natural presence and confidence to you that uh, I, I still think is one of the most fascinating superpowers I've ever seen. Your deep voice also helps a lot. Yes, um, it's a natural, it's a people pattern match that to confidence. That's right. It's the perfect podcasting voice. But, you know, in the series A, I mean, you literally introduced me to every investor, every like big tier one investors in the Valley. And you even went to some of these meetings with me to try and help. And like, I was so scared, right? Because I had this framework of, well, these are VCs. These are the, the most impressive human beings ever, right? Clearly, like, these are big <laughs> deals. And like, who am I? I'm like some lowly guy that's pretending he knows how to start a company. I think like self-deprecation makes you really nervous. And I got in the Series A, you know, I talked to probably... 30, 40 investors. And the investor I ended up investing, Josh at Jackson Square, which I'm immensely grateful for, was really the only one willing to bet on us. And he discovered us through his doctor when he was having his first kid, his OBGYN recommended Script Dash at the time. And he just fell in love with the product and was willing to, to kind of bet that I would, I would grow into myself. And the Series C, I think I talked to 97 investors, something like that, um, before we could get around together. And I think during that time, that there's moments where you're like, I mean, are they all right? Maybe we shouldn't raise money because this is a bad company and a bad business. And I think in the Series C, I was able to just be okay with that. Say, well, yeah, maybe this is a terrible company and we don't deserve to survive. And I think somebody needs to do something in this industry because there's like a lot of humans being being really screwed by the system. There's people dying for really dumb reasons that we can solve and we are solving and people love our product that we're doing. We're struggling to make the economics work and the blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, this thing we're creating, I have an attachment. Like I want this to exist and I think I can do this. And so I don't know, we'll, we'll find out, right? If investors don't want to do it, who cares? I think both having less of a admiration for investors in general it sounds a bit negative but i mean it more as like you're not putting them on a pedestal exactly they're just making bets like who, who what do they know they're no better than me and so my job is just i want to do this company let me try to make it work and if i can i can't but identification you will have as a founder with your company it, it kind of means that if the company dies you die so when people ask questions about your company you take it personally you're like, well, no, it's doing great. And when you can move out of that to, I'm looking at my company from the outside too, just like you, Mr. Investor, and we can talk about the company together. Well, yeah, this is a challenge for us. You know, This is kind of how I think we might be able to solve that. When you de-identify with it, there's this calmness and confidence that you end up communicating to candidates, to investors, the world, right? And you realize, oh, I, I don't have to hide all the flaws. No one really cares. When you're hiding them, they know they're there and they get more 
triggered by that because they, they start trusting. They can you. sense it, right? They exactly. can sense that there's something there in your nervousness or the way you're presenting. There's something important in there that vulnerability is confidence. Exactly. You know, if you can say, hey, here's what's wrong about our business, but here's what's really great. And we think the really great outweighs what we're still figuring out. Then people are like, oh, okay, this guy's confident and he knows what the problems are and he's working on addressing them. Whereas if you're trying to hide all the problems, you're like, everything's great, but you know, they could, people could see through that and they can sense that. And I actually think what's, what's worse though is when you start telling that stories to investors, you start believing it, right? And you, you start being somewhat ashamed of the problems you have and what it'll do is affect your actual company where you won't be willing to say, well, oh yeah, this is a problem team. We need to go solve this problem. You'll be scared of that problem. So you, want, you don't want your team to know. Everyone knows though. And so you don't work on it. And the flip side of that is stop thinking of investors as the goal. Think of your company and just be critical. Keep trying to be better. And then whenever investors ask about it, be honest, just so you can stay in integrity as to what your company needs to be doing. Yeah, I 100% agree. And another thing that I really loved and kind of came up when we were talking about this and confidence was... I think there's a powerful idea in here that confidence is a learned behavior. It's interesting for me to hear you say, oh, you know, I've always admired you, Justin, as a mentor who has this ultimate well of self-confidence because I actually was not a person who was very self-confident when I was younger, when I was a kid, even when I was in my early days of doing a startup, when I was in my early 20s, you know, kind of similar to when you were starting off. I think it's really important. People see the outside and they see kind of the way people present and they think, oh, that's the whole story. But, you know, part of the reason I really want to do this podcast is to to show that like everyone comes from somewhere and goes through a journey. And my experience has been learning self-confidence over time, you know, and becoming more and more confident in myself, partially through the ways that we, we just talked about. I think that is what kept me from um, starting to build confidence. It, It was the uh, presumption that you're born with it or not, I don't have it, so I'm screwed and I'll never have it, which like will just keep you not being confident, right? Because you're in your own head. And really the power of meditation and a lot of this, this consciousness work that has been so amazing to have you as a spokesperson for is that you'll start noticing yourself saying these things to you and you can just stop, right? But th- that's why this kind of awareness is so important for you to start just seeing it. And it's surprising how little work you need to do. You really just need to be aware of it. And naturally things start changing. You just see your behaviors changing without really understanding why. Yeah. So I found that to be the same for myself. Can you talk a little bit about your practice with regards to meditation and how it is implemented in your daily life? Yeah. You know, when I started meditating, I couldn't grapple with anything, but I'm really good at this, right? Because like, I have to be really good at this. Like, I'm not a failure, Justin. I'm amazing at everything. <laughs> and that, that probably slowed me down by like a year because I wasn't willing to get better because I thought it was great. So I would sit for 10 minutes a day, you know, I would listen to, I use uh, the Waking Up app by Sam Harris. And I would just listen to it and be like, oh, great. I'm so good at this meditation thing. And I think slowly as I, I sort of built a little bit of awareness through that, I came to see how, just how massively busy my mind is and how difficult it can be to wrestle with at times. And you know, today I, I do 30 minutes of meditation every morning. I get up early around 5.30 or 6. I do a half hour of meditation. And th- that's kind of going to the gym, right? But it's almost like most of us work in construction, basically. And right, you go to the gym to get stronger, but really you're working out all day. And that's way, way more important. If anything, I find meditating in the morning is almost just fun. And I would take the day-to-day what I do for the other you know, 18 hours I'm awake over the, the sitting meditation practice. In every single moment, you can start being aware of your own patterns. And the, the best flag for me has been anytime I'm emotional in some way, if I have an emotional response to anything, I won't know in the moment or maybe even for years, but that means something. There's something there to explore, right? So when I get angry, when I get frustrated, when I get sad, when I get afraid, those are just the flags of saying, look, you've got something to learn here. And you won't be willing at first, and there will be way too many. And then just slowly, you just ask yourself, like, huh, why am I angry? Why am I afraid? What am I actually afraid of? 
and you give yourself an answer and your answer will shift and change over time. And just building that in like, do this a hundred times, a day, two times a day to start. Just do this as many times a day as you can. And you start just being aware of a bunch of stuff. And then you just start naturally changing your behavior. That practice has been the most powerful for me. And this is where the, this conscious leadership approach of how do you apply this to a corporate world has been so powerful because it gives you permission with others to play this game. Instead of debating things, you can approach it with curiosity. And that basically, it's like turbo for your awareness practice because you're forced in a way to do it every day, all day. And it's actually super fun. Yeah, I've been doing the same thing myself, which is trying to bring the practice into real life. I feel like that's something that for whatever reason, isn't really talked about as much meditation. You know, people think of meditation as maybe it's something you do it by opening an app and you sit down and you're, you're by yourself. I understand that the concept of calling it practice, right, is that it's practice for real life. It's all about bringing it back into your life and bring the awareness of your present state and the experiential phenomenon that occur in consciousness back into your daily life. And so, you know, I have this bracelet that says meditate. Now, every time I look at it, I try to remember, okay, bring myself back to the present and what is my experience in this moment? And then just seeing that. And like you said, that's made a huge change in my experience through the world. You know, you see yourself ruminating or anxious or worried or angry. And instead of getting sucked along with that, you're able to maybe create a little bit of space and then decide how you want to show up. Or I guess people would call it act skillfully, respond skillfully. Um, something though on, on that I had as a block around a lot of this work early on is, and I, I hear this from people a lot is, well, like it, it's going to make me worse at my job or it's going to make me less driven. It's going to make me less able to do something like you get this fear of, well, I am who I am and that's, what's got me here. I don't want to change it. Right. What if something goes away? And I probably still wrestle with that to an extent, every step function change in my own awareness and, and competence there in a way is difficult because I get scared that something will change meaningfully with me and I won't be as good at what I do. And yet in retrospect, it's only helped me be way better at everything I do and happier in life. There's literally been zero downside for me. And you know, everyone has their own experience, of course, but I, I hear that a lot that people are afraid that this won't be purely beneficial for them. Yeah. You know, I guess you think of the Zen masters and like, well, you know, they're just hanging out all day. How could this possibly be helpful for me? Yeah, I think of meditation as a toolkit or a skill for accomplishing whatever you want to accomplish in your life. One of the things uh, my meditation teacher, Janish, talks about is defining your values so that when you do reach states of you know, extreme equanimity and maybe you're much more conscious and able to decide how you show up in the world, you can decide to show up based on what your values are that you've already defined. So instead of getting pulled along unconsciously, we're just making conscious decisions to move us in whatever direction is that we wanted in the first place. Exactly. Exactly. You end up building this permission for yourself to just go get what you want without worrying about the why, right? Maybe wanting something is perfectly good enough reason to go do it and get it. You don't have to be the best at something or have some made up ethical moral reason to go get something. Just go do it because you want to. And what else are you going to do? Yeah. All right. I want to move on and I want to talk a little bit about mentors. You know, on your way to get to where you're at now and understanding there's still a long ways to go and you're not done yet. What are the, some of the things you've learned and who have you learned from and what are some of the things you've learned along the way? I think maybe the, the first part of this is around the, the team you build. Right. And inevitably, if you build a company that requires humans, you're going to have end up hiring a lot of people. And there's this fallacy that most sort of founders that start young fall into of, well, like maybe the early people I hire will scale. And the reality is no one will, including yourself. And the CEO, who's the founder, you can kind of get away with not scaling as long as you're not running an individual function, right? You're just hiring people to run those who can do it really well. But it's actually counterproductive to hire the person that knows how to run a 100-person org or a 1,000-person org when you have a 1-person org. They won't know how to do the 1-person org either, right? And so it is like 
merely reality that you have to layer and replace people along the way, which is extremely difficult and uncomfortable, especially because the early team just give their blood, sweat, and tear to it. And you, you feel this almost like um, like an obligation. Obligation to them, right? I, I'm doing them a disservice by hiring someone else. And in reality, you're not. You're helping them learn. They might not see it. And that's okay, too. They can get angry. They can leave. But in reality, you're doing not them or yourself or your company a service. But I, I've found a huge amount of learning from the people I've hired the teams have been able to build over time. And you start learning just from their lack of ability to scale this very difficult skill of conflict, right? And and I think driving conflict has been one of the biggest blockers and probably one of the biggest impediment to our company since day one, just my own ability to, to be with that. Well, let's talk about that. So you are somebody who historically has been a little conflict averse, right? Tell me about conflict aversion and how that's been for you. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I think back 10, 15 years ago, I was extremely shy, introverted, didn't like to talk to people. And I've come to appreciate, especially in recent years, how much that has been driven by just my own need to have people like me, right? I hate when people don't like me. I want everyone to love me. Who wouldn't want that? And when it comes to running a company, that's a really difficult tendency to wrestle with because you have to manage your team. And I want people to give me feedback. I actually love receiving negative feedback because that's where you learn. And I, I, I have an easy time receiving it. I just can't give it to people. I just, oh, they won't like me. They'll be upset. They'll think I'm doing this to hurt them. I, I have all these stories in my head. And it definitely like burned a lot of bridges and it hurt a lot of people by withholding from them. One of our co-founders left in the early years of the company primarily because I wasn't willing to have conflict. I wasn't willing to tell this person, hey, this isn't working. Hey, don't do this. This is what you need to go do and be firm. Instead, I would kind of tiptoe around and I was just immature about it. And I I take a lot of responsibility for for what happened there. I think this really plagued me. I mean, it still plagues me to this day. I think I've I've improved and gotten better and better over over the years, but it's still something I find difficult. And unfortunately, everyone that tried to teach me how to get better at it took way too brute force of an approach. It was like, well, Matt, you know, write your feedback down. And then, you know, well, just read it to this person, right? Well, write it on a document. I think that was my advice. (laughs) (laughs) I do think I said this to me once. (laughs) Yeah. And the reality is that, like, it's not a content problem. It's not that I don't know the content to say. It's that I, I have a block of a belief that I hold about what giving this feedback will mean. And the, the way out of that for me has been like, you do a little bit, you observe the reaction, you notice, oh, it was, went okay. And you, you just keep doing small steps and you're doing a compassionate way towards yourself, right? And yet the, the brute force approach that so many people try to teach me has this tone of, well, Matt, you're failing. You're doing a bad job. You are incompetent because you can't do this. Go do it and stop complaining. That just won't work. Right? That's not how humans can overcome a blockage like that. And, you know, it really probably is in the last year that I, I've gone sort of leapfrog myself in, in, in my ability to have this conflict diversion. And so self-kindness has been key in kind of making that change, it sounds like. That's right. And I think that that's one thing that I've noticed myself as well that's been really important for me is – I think it never works. Well, in my experience, right? It doesn't work to say this part of myself is bad and I hate it and it, I've got to change. It's really hard to change from that foundation. And what's worked for me is to say, oh, I see why I'm this way. I need, similar to you, I need other people to like me really badly. I'm desperate for other people's approval. And instead of saying, oh, that's disgusting and I really don't want to be <laughs> like that, it's been easier to say, oh, okay, I see why I'm that way because. I didn't get the approval from my peers that I wanted when I was a kid or from my parents or you know whatever. And that part of me has actually led to a lot of good things. That, that drive to get approval has led to a lot of good things in my life, becoming an entrepreneur and becoming successful and sharing a lot of wisdom on Twitter or whatever it is, right? And I love that part of me and I accept it. And I can decide, 
is that how I want to show up in the world in the future? You know, do I That's want right. to continue being the person who's like worried about what a hundred thousand people on Twitter think every day? Is that how I want to show up in the future in my own life? And then I can make that decision. Maybe it is, or, or maybe not, but it's not coming from a basis of self hatred. It's coming from a basis of self kindness. That's right. And self acceptance. The key there for me was this practice of trying to recognize the positive intent of your own behavior, right? Especially for behaviors you judge to be bad in yourself or avoiding conflict and wanting approval or love and approval of others. Like, well, can you find the positive intent? Can't we all say, well, yeah, conflict is never super pleasant. I don't like when other people don't like me. We want people to like, uh, yeah, that, that all makes perfect sense. And can you see how that doesn't serve you all the time? Right. And it doesn't have to make it bad. It's just, I want to make a different choice moving forward. Absolutely. So tell me a little bit about the confusion between self-awareness and self-criticism. Oh, yeah. We talked about this a little while ago. This, I think, is common in a certain personality type of young founders. And I have observed others that, that did the same thing I did. And I probably still do this to an extent. But you find yourself to be very self-aware, right? That, that's a, something I would have said about myself, you know, five years ago. Oh, well, you know, I, people give me feedback. I receive it well. I, you know, I'm willing to, to think, yeah, this might, might or might not be true. I tend to give myself a lot of feedback, which seems like, oh, well, I'm very self-aware. And kind of spin to that has been for me to discover how really not self-aware I am, just self-critical. And that negativity of being self-critical means you're just making yourself wrong all the time to avoid facing something else, right? And you know, I, I think of fundraising. I would just tell myself this story. Well, it's just because I'm bad at fundraising that I'm struggling to raise this round. But it's purely because of that. It's not because you know, there's some metric in the business I should work on. There's members of the team I should be upgraded. It's not because of the business. It, it's just because I'm not good at, at fundraising. If I was Justin Khan with all his confidence, then, you know, then I'd be willing to raise. Instead of being self-aware, which was be like, oh, you know, I could work on being better at fundraising. And if these four things are true, and if I was listening to the feedback I get from investors and worked on that in my business, then maybe I'd have an easier time fundraising beating yourself up doesn't really ever lead to much, right? Self-awareness is really just, oh yeah, this is true. Do I want to change it or not? Self-deprecation is, oh, I'm so shitty. I'm so bad. I'm terrible. I'm bad at this. I need to be better. I think that's an important distinction. I really think that people confuse the two a lot and it causes them to just not want to improve, not to be static. There's a lot around shame there too, right? Like I think the more um, self-critical you become, the more ashamed you'll become of who you are and, and what you're able to do in your own abilities, which then kind of leads to not always the best decisions. One thing that comes to mind here and, and back to kind of your, your earlier question on mentors, I recently hired a president and COO, Kevin, and it's been the last you know, four or five months, four months, I guess now, since he, since he joined has been the most fun I've had since starting the company. It's been just such an amazing time. And I don't think I've learned as much as I have from my entire life in those four months. I'm immensely grateful to Kevin. And the reason I hired him, despite a lot of people be like, well, Matt, you're like giving up too much power. You know, Matt, this person will steal the company from you. Like, Matt, are you scared about this and that? I got a lot of fear from others. And for me, I mean, I had spent five months with him getting to know him first. And I saw in him something I wanted to improve on. And I accepted the fact that I'm not able to do this yet. Oh, that's okay. I have an 800 person company. I'm 30. I had managed zero people five years ago. <laughs> right. And I didn't know what like finance was and like what HR did. I've learned an immense amount. I'm, I'm doing my best. And ooh, I've got a lot to learn. And I want to go learn it. That sounds fun. So let me find someone that can help me, can teach me and learn. And let me find someone who's willing to have a partnership with me where I don't have that fear of, oh, you know, somebody will screw me over in some way. But I, I could see how a self-deprecating version of that, which I fell into before, and I had this with one of my executives, had more of the flavor of, well, we're in a fight, right? You're taking on too much. I'm taking on too much. You're not doing a good job. I can't tell you that, though. And I, I got into this very toxic relationship with one of my executives because I wasn't approaching it with this, hey... I need to learn. You can teach me. Please teach me. 
there's a certain humility that's necessary in order to get to that place. And I think a lot of times in startups, there's a little bit of a false humility where it's easy to say, be vulnerable after the fact, but really when you're in it to say like, oh, I actually need someone who's an expert and I want to <laughs> partner with them. That's a step that most people have trouble with. Yeah. I mean, I think I would assume most people recognize that they just struggle to admit it either to themselves or to others. Right. But I think it's hard to be struggling and not recognize that, you know, you need to change something. I think it's just hard to admit it. Yeah. All right. That's, those are the things I had. Any other, any other stories that were missing from the early days? Funny, uh, funny Alto stories. Oh gosh. I'm sure there's, there's, Countless. I think maybe a bit more high level, but I think my biggest learning and what, what I wish I had realized when we started the company was just how much no one knows how to do this. Right? I think there's a bit of a fallacy that you know there's a way to start a company and be successful, and there's some structure to it. There's some framework to follow. You know, if you read enough media blog posts, somehow you'll know what to do. And the truth is, no one actually knows how to do this. And every company is a shit show in some way. And every company is scared and doesn't know what to do. This is just reality. And the sooner, I, just, I wish I could have admitted that to myself, not a year ago, but way earlier. Because if you can admit that, you let go of this fear of like, I'm not doing this right. I'm doing it wrong. I'm doing it incorrectly. At the end of the day, no one knows how to do it. There's no right way to do it. Just do whatever in that moment seems like the right idea. You'll be wrong most of the time. That's okay. You just have to be right enough times to not die and to keep growing and to make more money and to be a successful company. That's it, right? You'll get it wrong all the time. The goal is it not to be wrong. And I got really stuck on there's a right way to do it. Right? There's tech companies, you know, this is what they do. I need to follow this framework. Well, this Medium article says this is what I need to, to do. And like, I'm not doing it right. I don't know, man, who writes these Medium articles? It's a bunch of random people that a lot of them have never done this, don't know how to do it. Or it worked for them. Maybe it worked in spite of that, not because of that, right? Yeah. And a lot of this pattern matching, I think we're, we're often addicted to in Silicon Valley, is what really, regardless of your career, is what makes us enable to think personally progress. Awesome. Anything else you want to talk about? The transition to spiritual, Justin. I haven't really talked about it generally, just in the context of reflecting back like various guests, what their you know experiences have been and kind of share some of my own within that. I, mean, I, I think back to the Justin I met in 2015, who had this kindness to him, right? Like you let me hang out to your house for really no good reason. I'm honestly kind of confused about it. Yet you were just dramatically a different human being than you are today. It's it's extremely easy for me to notice. What have you noticed that's different? I'm curious because it's interesting to see. I feel like people's growth, you know, it's very hard for them to observe their own growth because mm -hmm. it happens gradually over time. But for other people, it's much more easy because, you know, you kind of see it in these fits and starts or screenshots every month or months or whatever. You know, I, I think that the Justin I met in 2015 had, I think I could sense a pain running away from the feeling, right? Where I would observe you jokingly pretend to have some ego or some, you, you would pretend to be a caricature of yourself. But I, I felt it came from a place of not wanting to be something else, of pain. You know, I, I remember you built this LaCroix throne at some point. <laughs> and you I put a little remember. hat with like a LaCroix uh, box or a crown. You know, I, I was like, that's funny. And th there's like an edge to that, that I'm, I'm feeling of like, there's like a sadness to it. Or like your, your G-Wagon or you bought your G-Wagon. You were like jokingly say what a, <laughs> uh, what like a, a, a dickish car it is to buy in a way. But how you wanted to buy the six-wheeled version, but you bought the four-wheeled version to be a bit more reasonable. Yeah. And what I, and you know, started Atrium and you had told me was, well, you know, I just, I want a big company with a lot of employees. <laughs> and what I observed today is you're kind of still willing to play that role, 
but it, I, I feel this comedy to it. I feel this this ease and this laughter to it, where you're you're starting a fund now called Goat Greatest of All Time, which is like that's just Justin. That's the character of Justin. It's so fun, and I, I don't feel that sadness and that pain behind it. I feel it comes from a, a bit of this you know, finding yourself funny. Yeah. I think there's an element where before I needed the world to be a certain way, right? I, th- I was funny and able to be self-deprecating and laugh at myself in a way. The G-Wagon is kind of an asshole's car but <laughs> for tryhards, but I always wanted it when I was a kid. And there was an element of, yes, I do want to be the cool kid that I wanted to be when I was a, a kid. And I didn't get to be, and I wanted to be successful and seen as successful. And I wanted to, I needed the world to show up in a certain way. And I think today, you know, I've really worked hard at letting all that go. I've worked hard at letting go of the need for the world to be any certain type of way. And I think mostly it's worked. It's not perfect. I think it's very hard to get to complete release of all desires, but I think I've let go of a lot that I used to hold on to. Yeah. The interesting thing is how it doesn't have to affect that much of what you decide to do, right? Which is back to what we had talked about around this fear that you'll change, right? You'll just want to go, you know, meditate for 10 years in a monastery. You can do all the same things. I think what what I've felt very different from you is the where it comes from and your own just kind of energy around it, which is so much more at peace versus more kind of afraid or shameful or it had an edge to it that I don't sense in you at all anymore. Yeah, I think it does. That's right. It comes from what do I find intrinsically joyful and what do I like to do? What do I think is important to do in the world? And let's do those things instead of coming from, oh, I need this because of some extrinsic reason. Yeah. And you've always had this desire to help and to mentor. This has just been intrinsically you, which is why there's kind of always been this confusion I had of, well, Justin seems kind of scary and he was willing to spend time and energy and money with me, not because I deserved it anyway, just because he wanted to, right? And that that always felt like, well, that's because that's Justin. And he's pretending to be this hard exterior at times, but at bottom, Justin just really loves to help and to mentor and to help grow founders. You know, it's kind of like both of those people exist, right? We're all multifaceted. You know, there's a part that loves to mentor others and, and really feel of service and to help people. And then there's a part of me also that wants the world to be a certain way and was like, I really need the world to show up a certain way in terms of my success or how things are going in order to get the fulfillment or validation or whatever that I, I need from the external world. You know, that's the part that would be screaming about the numbers not being high enough or, or whatever it is. So, you know, both of those people exist in the same body. Yeah. And we'll back to you know, what we had said around that self-compassion, self-love, right? That part is in large part what drove you to what you accomplished to date, which is by any measure pretty amazing. And it's not in any way bad. It's just, well, that's what drove you. Oh, that's, that's true. Thanks, Matt. I appreciate that. Last one, last question is what's the future growth path for you? What are the things that you're working on or the things that you're interested in right now that you think are going to take your personal growth to the next level? I guess this is probably something we haven't really, haven't really talked about. I, I think something in, in conjunction with a lot of what I've done at work and around meditation and, and consciousness has been therapy. And I, I generally think like modern psychology is, is pretty inept and counterproductive at times. And I, I think I churned through five, six therapists before finding someone that resonated with me, but I think I've gotten as much growth from therapy than I have in some of this more day-to-day stuff. And I have more and more realizing how as much as I thought I had a almost idyllic childhood, there's inevitably a lot of trauma that you take on as a kid who doesn't know how to handle so much in the world. And as I've kind of delved into that with my therapist and guide, if you will, I've come to really I think, see how, and this is like pop psych almost, like how a lot of what happens to you in childhood affects your behavior and your decision making and what triggers you when you're an adult. And I, well, in the last probably seven, eight months, spent a lot of time there. And I think there's more and more I'm uncovering as I'm diving in 
to kind of my own personal history. And I think probably the next kind of six years, six months, a year for me is going to be doing a lot of work, just their personal growth, you know, let alone work. I know this is something we had talked about, but even in a starting company context, the pace of growth of your company will follow and track your own personal growth and you will be the bottleneck, right? Or you leave, right? But like, as long as you're there and you're running the company, you will be the bottleneck, not anything else. And I think it's extremely important to spend time on kind of as many facets as you can there, even if your kind of selfish goal is just, I want this company to make me a lot of money. I want to be successful. Even if just for that, it's worth doing this work. But for me, I think therapy and then sort of more of this childhood stuff has been my kind of next big meaty problem to uh, to attack a problem. I guess I shouldn't say problem. Under self-awareness, area of exactly. self-understanding. It's interesting how they kind of go hand in hand, therapy and meditation, or really understanding our childhood experiences and how they play out in these habits or ways of interacting or responding to the world as adults. And then the tools of meditation and really being aware of your experience. It's kind of like two sides of the same coin of understanding. You know, you're seeing why you interact with the world in a certain way and then being conscious of that experience and deciding what to do with it moving forward. It is surprising as you start recognizing it, just how silly some of your patterns are and how much you will rationalize. Oh, you know, I behave this way because, you know, of of this great reason. Well, I'm conflict diverse because, uh, oh, you know, it's, I don't want to be mean. It's like, well, no, it's it's like usually probably not it. And as you start doing awareness work, you start diving into more of the therapy side, you you just start putting things together and it becomes really obvious why you do certain things. Yeah. I think silly is without the negative connotation that might bring, I think silly is my favorite way of looking at it. Cause you're like, oh, (laughs) that that was pretty simple. Um, I I can just choose to, to, to do something else, but I've seen kind of a direct correlation with therapy and then dealing with sort of childhood traumas and my ability to, to function at work. Amazing. All right. I think that's it. Thank you for coming on. And I think people will really find a lot of the things we talked about very valuable. Awesome. Well, I appreciate being on Justin and I'm really excited for your podcast. Um, and I've listened to, to most of them at this point. I think it's really awesome what you're doing. And you've rated everyone five stars, right? Of course. <laughs> and uh, message for everyone, you should go right now, rate five stars from Justin's podcast on all of the channels you can find and uh, tell your friends about it. Boom. All right. Thanks, Matt. All right. Thank you, Justin. All right, guys. That was my conversation with Matt. I really loved how candid he is about his own failings and areas of improvement. And I hope that you all got something out of it. If you liked it, you know what to do. Bang out that five-star rating. If you didn't like it, do me a favor and bang out that five-star rating anyways. And as always, send your feedback on Twitter at Justin Khan. I love you all, and I'll see you next week.